Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another Career Chats. I'm Natasha Wilkerson, director of Space Club, brought to you by Communities in Schools of San Antonio through the NASA New Worlds Await You program led by the Wex Foundation. I would like to welcome all of our Space Club students and we have some teams also watching who are participating in the New Worlds Await You Lunar Habitat Design and Technology Competition that was launched this year. And we're just really excited to see what you guys come up with. But today for our career chat is a special guest who is going to be very helpful for those participating in the competition as he's very knowledgeable on space architecture. Um, so as a reminder also for Space Club students, stick around to the end because there will be a raffle like we always have. So let's get to our career chat. So our guest today is Sam Jimenez. His current job, he has a couple different roles. He's a space architect and founder CEO of Exarch Exploration Architecture Corporation, as well as Astroport Space Technologies and the WEX Foundation. And we're going to give him a chance to tell us what all those different organizations are. His background, he has a Bachelor's of Environmental Design from Texas A&M University and a Master's of Architecture in Space Architecture from the University of Houston. Sam, welcome to Career Chats. Well, hello, how are you doing? Hello, I'm doing there? good. Uh, glad to be in, uh, able to, to talk to you all. Well, to kind of start us off, I think the students were like, okay, what exactly does he do? There's so many titles and different organizations. So can you give us an overview of each of these different groups? Well, it's not just students, but also uh, people that I work with. They don't understand how, how I uh, interact with all these different groups and this different organizations. Um, but they all have one common purpose. The purpose is to go to space and to colonize and to be uh, multi-planet species at some point in developing the technologies for that. So, so let me just go through the three organizations. Uh, so Exploration Architecture Corporation, or Exarch, was my first company that I founded in 2007. So we're about maybe, uh, you know, getting close to, uh, uh, what, seven, 22 years old, 20 years old, can, 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 uh, <laughs> I can't compute it. It's been so long. Let them do uh, the math. Yeah. So, um, and that company was set up to uh, do spaceport design. Hmm. So we we look at the uh, uh, spaceports like a uh, New Mexico where they built this uh, uh, first commercial spaceport called the uh, for where in New Mexico where the Virgin Galactic uh, spaceship took off from just recently. It was last yeah. year. And we were part of that design team. And then we uh, decided to look at the lunar based designs and habitation. Um, but that didn't happen for a while because NASA had a program called Constellation that didn't go forward. So I, I set up the company called Wex Foundation, which is a nonprofit STEM education where we want to start bringing students into, into the careers of space uh, exploration and learn, learn how to be an engineer or even a, a, any kind of career that you want to pursue apply it to space. And that started in 2007. So that's really our, our pipeline of students to go into is these other companies and into companies in general for exploration of, of the solar system. And then recently, uh, uh, to, uh, in 2020, I stood up uh, Astroport Space Technologies. And you can think of them as the civil engineers. We, we're developing technologies that actually are the technologies that you use to make things on the moon, make uh, lunar infrastructure. And we're focusing on how to make a lunar landing pad on the lunar surface. So you think of the XR company as the space architects, the architects essentially, and Astroport as the civil engineers. Yeah. And then and then we have the Wix Foundation as the pipeline of the talent we need to have to do the projects that we need to uh, work on. So we 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 fund them with the sponsorships and, and, and different programs, some scholarships and try to get them you know, all the way through college uh, uh, and eventually into hopefully our companies or, and then other companies in the aerospace business. That's essentially how it all works together. So speaking about kind of this workforce development, this pipeline, I wanted to start with your pathway to where you are today. So what encouraged you to study in this field? This is a question from Jumble Jupiters in Indiana. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, um, I've been around since 1987 when they were with the when the first Challenger uh, uh, shuttle missions were happening, and NASA at that time 
uh, was uh, building a space station. Uh, I was not an archi uh, space architect then. I was a regular architect doing a regular career in architecture. And I read about that NASA was going to build a house in space, essentially. I wanted to be there. I wanted to be in the, at the forefront, at, the, at the, the cutting edge of technology, cutting edge of the career that I had chosen in architect. And that was, at that time, space architecture. So I found some professors at the University of Houston who were just beginning a new program called uh, uh, Space Architecture, as a degree of space architecture. And I went to them and I you know, started studying with them. And we were working then at that point on the very first concepts for the space station that has now been flying uh, since, you know, for almost 20 years. And uh, so we were de designing the uh, habit, you know, habitable areas for, this, for the astronauts and then working also on lunar bases. And that kind of kind of grabbed me and hooked me into the into the space. Once you get involved with space, it's kind of you know addictive. You can't you really can't get away away from it. It's this it's so challenging, it's so exciting. Uh, and this and I'll tell you this right now, no matter what career you pursue, what what uh, things you think you want to do in life, whether it's a, being a, a, a chef, or being a biologist, being a, an engineer or being a lawyer or an artist, you can have a career in space. And that's that's what we want to. That's how we're trying to trying to focus on on our on our students. So anyway, that the uh, you know the, the the idea that I was able to work with NASA uh, kept me in the career. And, and and then at that time there were no space architects. There were a few, and I was one of the first ones uh, 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 that was able to pursue this this path. Well, let's get into some of the work that you've been doing. So looking at lunar bases was one of the topics students were interested in. So I, our first question here is how long did it take for you to design lunar bases from the International Space Team of Alliance in Florida? So believe it or not, this design here uh, was a design that we did in 1987 when NASA thought they were going to go to the moon back then. Wow. NASA's been trying to go back to the moon for a long time now, but it's 50 years since the Apollo landed there. And, uh, and, and you know what? A lot of these designs have not changed a lot since then. It's the the uh, technology has changed, and there's more technologies that make it more affordable. But the basic concepts of how you do it, how you set up a base, how you build it, what you need to do uh, to live on the lunar surface, th those are not changed yet. Hmm. And, and it won't change until we get there. When we get there, we'll really learn about how it actually happens. You know, what what are the things we don't know? We don't know things that uh, that uh, that we what we don't know essentially. And so these designs are are still relevant, and we continue to improve them because as technologies come into play as well, new technology like three D printing. We didn't have three D printing back then, but now we do, and now we're talking about three D printing structures on the moon, which makes it a lot easier because now you don't need to bring a whole lot of mass, uh, uh, which costs a lot of money to, to launch from Earth. You can uh, use the, the regolith, what they call the lunar soil. It's called regolith, and turn that into materials for the construction, like melting it, and and uh, into bricks and hardened concrete, and making it that way. All right. Okay, so what type of technologies do you research? This is a question from Star Nova in Florida. Yeah, you know, most of our technologies are for uh, living on the lunar surface. How do you actually construct uh, a base or, or make a landing pad? And it's not just one technology that is used for that. You know, for example, not just 3D printing. And there's also robots. You know, how do you make the robots talk to each other and, and work with each other without anybody being there? That's what's called autonomous robotics. Where they can, where they're smart, and they they know where they are in place and time because there's no GPS. You know, your phone is uses the, the GPS system, and it knows it can pinpoint where we're at at any point on the globe. Well, there's no GPS on the moon, so you have to put what we call onboard positioning, and that allows the robot to know where it is in place and time, and where other robots are, so they can communicate to know where they need to go to to do, for example, excavation. Uh, or digging a, digging a trench or, or you know, leveling out the, the surface. And that's a coordinated effort. So those are, those are what we call automation and, and, and positioning technologies. Uh, there are also things that uh, uh, human factors, for example. You know, when we live there uh, in these habitats, we don't want to bring dust into the habitat. 
and because it's pretty it's pretty dangerous the dust the lunar dust is very really problematic you can't breathe it because it'll you know you get sick with it it's real uh, uh, sharp and it will cut your lungs up essentially Mm-hmm. So we want to be able to monitor the, if dust gets into the into the module. So we do sensing technologies where we can take little bitty little sensors, and they can measure just the micron level grains that are floating in the air or or that came into the into the module, and that you can you can warn uh, the the inhabitants you know that there is accumulation of dust that needs to be taken care of. And th- those are so those are sensing technologies as well. So just the, you know the, the whole realm of, of different things that uh, go into habit what we call habitability and how do you habitate uh, as a human being on the on the lunar surface or on Mars or any planet as well or in the space stations. And those are are really good tips for any teams watching that are in the lunar habitat competition. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe some ideas that they could research more and incorporate into their into their designs. Yes. Uh, uh, we're real proud of, the, of this competition where the Wex Foundation is sponsoring. Uh, you know, how do you live in the uh, you know in these caves? Right. You know, the reason we want to go to the caves is because we want to get protected from the micrometeorites and the radiation. If we can live in the caves, we, you know, we have we don't have to bury ourselves uh, under in, under the regolith. For example, you see that picture there with all that white uh, uh, that was on top of the. I think the previous picture showed more of the modules. Well, that is a concept for bag, putting bags around the, the modules, the sandbags, essentially. Mm-hmm. Taking the regolith and putting sandbags on top of it. You know, you need almost three feet of sandbags. That's pretty, that's pretty hard to do, labor intensive. So if we can go underground, that's what we want to do. That's the, that's the reason the, the caves are important. And we, we know there are caves on the lunar surface, and they're big caves, huge caves. Some people think you can even put a, sky, a skyscraper inside one of these caves that, that they're that big. So once we get down there, uh, that's what we want to uh, understand. Uh, what kind of technologies for, you know, construction technologies you need to use for that as well. Hmm. Well, let's switch here to another one of your projects. Uh, this is a question from Galactic Empire, North Carolina. What is your coolest astronomical project? Oh, well, that's pretty cool. I like that name, Galactic Empire. Goes, <laughs> kind of goes with the, uh, the project here. Yeah. So, so this project was real fun to do. This one was, uh, it was a challenge that, that NASA gave us to go out and figure out how to capture an asteroid uh, so that we can mine the asteroid and, 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 and bring that asteroid, once you capture it, bring it back to, to around, around the moon so that it orbits around the moon and you can be able to mine it closer to the Earth and be able to get the minerals out of it and take them to back down to the moon or back to the Earth. So the idea was, uh, you know, well, how do you do that? I mean, how do you how do you take a big asteroid, you know, and and and, and stop it essentially? So it doesn't uh, you know, so you, you don't have a you know a, a problem you know, getting uh, around it. If you look at the picture there, uh, there's a little football field. Yeah. And, and so you see the size of the asteroid we're we're, we're trying to capture. Okay, this the small one that's there in the bottom. The big the big one there on top is kind of the typical size. We're only able to consider the smaller ones, which were more like like about a ten meter d- distance of, in, in diameter, and that was that's what we call the sail. It was an inflatable sail. So this 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 uh, this spacecraft came up to the ast- uh, asteroid from behind, and then it it, it launched the sail. And let's see if we can explain how this works. So I'll, I'll go, I'm going to go through the pictures here. Of, uh, that's got the six. Uh, I'm sorry, the right five. Here. Yeah. So. You capture you go you you stick up behind it essentially and this hail has this, this you know like you regular garbage can uh, bags when you you know the flex when they uh, when you put the garbage in them they flex and they stretch out mm-hmm. well, it's the same sort of concept that this material was going to was once the contact of the uh, asteroid uh, hit that that material the the sail is spinning so as it's spinning it hits the material and it gets wrapped up in that in that the bag, just like a candy wrapper essentially, and it twists it twists it up inside that bag, and then you can see at the at the last red one there, how it, it kind of wraps it up, and that's how you that's how that sail captured that asteroid. How do you and get it, inspiration for projects like this? And this is from Abraham in Illinois. Yeah, it's really a, a matter of looking around your your, your world that you live in. Um, Nature gives you a lot of ideas. 
nature always has a lot of already good solutions to things. And and if you can find something that works in nature and apply that to whatever problem you're trying to solve, uh, you'll usually come out pretty, you know, ahead of, ahead of yourself and, uh, and ahead of the game. Uh, there's a field called biomimicry. And biomimicry is the, is, the, is the process of looking at how nature does things and try and emulate that in, in mechanical systems. Uh, for example, the bumblebee is a, uh, is a good example. It's very hard to explain how a bumblebee actually flies. Aerodynamically, it's almost impossible how it, how it does it, but it's been able to, uh, to do that. And people have taken that kind of, those kind of uh, those challenges and seen how, how it works and, and been able to make drones and other kind of small little you know, you know, uh, flying machines based on the aerodynamics of, of, of other insects, you know, as, as just as, as an example. So, and then, and then again, your own experiences too. Uh, you, you could be uh, walking down the street and eating them, uh, some, uh, you know, unwrapping some candy and find out that, uh, you know, this way this is wrapped is pretty cool. You know, it's, it's got two ends on it. It wraps, you know, it, it, you know, the piece of thing in the middle of it is all wrapped up and you unfold, un, untwist it. And uh, you find out, well, that can apply to how do you capture an asteroid? And yeah. that's, where it, that's where it came from. <laughs> A candy wrapper. <laughs> <laughs> And, and I love this creative side that students often don't realize is a big part of science and engineering and especially design, because often when you're in school, there's one right answer, right? There's one answer on that test the teacher's looking for when you're trying to solve a math problem or doing something in science, like a chemistry lab. But in the real world, when you're tasked with a problem like how do you capture an asteroid? It sounds like there's just so many options and creativity. So can you talk a little bit about that? Like how the role creativity plays in uh, engineering and science? Yeah, it, it's really a, a, um, an opportunity when you have a challenge in front of you. It's not, it's not a problem, it's an opportunity. And I like look, that. And you look at it that way and you can start thinking, um, you know, I hate to use this term, it's so, so used, uh, out of the box. But but really, it is you're thinking think different. You try and find a, a you know, and at this point in time, when you're just starting the the process of trying to solve a problem, nothing's off the table. There are no dumb ideas. They all are valid, and until they're not valid, mm -hmm. and you put them out there, and you and you work the ones that seem like interesting or seem they could be workable until they don't work, and then you go on to the next one, and and you experiment, and so creativity is a lot of experimentation. Uh, a lot of trial and error, and a lot, a lot of intuition at the same time. Um, if you have a, an eye for, for, you know, for what pleases you or what uh, it seems like it's going to fit in your gut, you know, what 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 your gut's telling you, your you know your your heart's telling you, and you know, go down that path. So it's it's that's the kind of the creative part of the engineering side of it. But then when you get to the point where, all right, this seems like it's going to work. Then you get into the mechanics, and you get into the, the quantification, and you get into the math, and you get into the engineering. But the you know, you know again, in the very beginning, there's no dumb idea to to a mm -hmm. solution. Uh, the next question here is about failure. So, were there any failures when you were working on this, and how did you solve them from speed of life in New York? <laughs> That's a good question. It's a great question, actually. And uh, this actually goes back to the question about how did I get become a space architect? Um, one of my other companies that I, that I failed at uh, was a company called VideoPoint. And, and it was a company that, uh, this is all bef before the internet, by the way. There was no internet. But there was another technology that was trying to be like the internet. And it failed. But we didn't know it was going to be a failure. And I was using that, that technology for communicating uh for people to do wayfinding you know how do you find your way in a in a uh, in a world's fair or in a you know a crowded area and and we had a, a a job to go put this this wayfinding technology at new orleans world's fair in 1986 and the the world's fair fair itself was a failure because nobody came to it and our our role in that was to put these kiosks to tell people where to go and what exhibits were where and we were selling advertisement on it. And because nobody came to the World's Fair, it was, you know, uh, we went bankrupt. And by going bankrupt, 
as a company, it was, it was, you know, it was kind of devastating. You know, I, I had to figure out what was, what was I going to do next, and then how did I pick myself back up? And that's how I found space architecture. I said I was going to go back to my roots, the roots of what I wanted to be when I was young. You know, I wanted to be an architect, and again, I wanted to be at the cutting edge of architecture. And at that time, it was space architecture, and that's when I found these two professors at the University of Houston that had this program. And uh, by 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 seeing that there's other horizons in, in front of you, you you know you, you learn from failure. You learn from failure, and, and it really is a uh, it's it's you need to go through failure to be successful. Based bottom line. Yeah, and, and I think a lot of times students believe they need to know exactly what they want to be when they grow up. And a lot of the students are elementary, yeah. middle school, and you kind of had to find your way. And there was some failure, but eventually it kind of works out. So, you know, what advice do you have for students that are kind of struggling with, they don't know what they want to do? Experiment again, you know, try one thing and then this doesn't feel right. You know, you know, don't do it because you need a job or you need the money, you know, try and do, and if you do need the money, need a job, try and find something that you have a passion for. You know, really, you really need to be, have a passion for, for what you want to do and try and make that into a career. You know, you know, look for things that, that excite you, that, that get your, you know, your get you up in the morning, and and pursue those things. It could be anything, and and just and you never know how where it leads. You know, it could be a, 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 some sort of a, a simple type of job or some a simple uh, way of living, but if you pursue it, and you stick with it, and and you like it, and you ask yourself this question: Actually, would you do this for free? Right. <laughs> If the answer is yes, then you know you have the passion, and so then and 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 then and then continue on down that down that road because it'll come back to you and you could pay you back in spades. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Okay, so speaking of passions, let's talk a little bit outside of space architecture. Um, you talked a lot, a little bit about being um, in the bio we sent the students of being a city artist, and so Apollo eighteen from Indiana asked, "What did you design as a city artist?" So this was a, uh, a job I had uh, when I was right out of school, right out of uh, my undergraduate degree, which was environmental design. And I went to the city of South Lake Tahoe at the time, looking for what I wanted to do with my new career, my new diploma. Um, and and I, was, I was hitchhiking around the country and I landed in Lake Tahoe and I, I, I thought at that time I wanted to be an artist. I was gonna be a, you know, an artist and I ended up uh, convincing the, the city council people that you know they needed to have art in public places essentially put art in their in their public buildings big art you know big art that could be like murals and it could be uh, uh, sculptures and stuff and they and they actually uh, uh, funded us to do that so we had a team of, of uh, artists that was going around the, the city creating works of art for the library and the airport and the, all the public buildings and, uh, and that was that was kind of cool. Uh, but again, uh, I was I had wanderlust, and I wanted to go around the world. So I left, and I, I wanted to find a mentor, uh, an artist who was who was a famous artist who would mentor me and become an artist. And and that's where, I, uh, and that's where I, that's how I left that job <laughs> because I decided to leave and find somebody else to teach me how to be a better artist. Hmm. Yeah. What kind of uh, art was it? Like, what were you designing? So it was like uh, you see here, uh, abstract art is one one of the things that we were doing. So I was, I was one of the artists, but there was actually there were a team of us, uh, of seven of us, and they were doing different things. Uh, I was doing wood wood sculptures as well. We would take like uh, old wood and uh, and and sculpt it out into into uh, uh, montages or or murals of some sort. Combine materials with it, like rocks and and foams and stuff, and turn. And have a you know some kind of a scene of a it's like back at that time it was in the mountains so some kind of mountain scene a scene uh, there was there were ceramics we were doing too uh, putting like uh, making ceramics and uh, and into murals and put them on the, into the walls on or on the walls in the uh, in the building and, and basic painting too uh, there's another one there was another artist that was doing just huge uh, uh, oil canvas paintings that would be that he was stretching almost the wall size type canvases and making paintings as well and i imagine that a lot of this um 
kind of creative work became useful later, we talked about creativity and engineering and architecture, right? So like, how did that translate to what the work you do now? Uh, yeah, so you, you know, as an artist, you always, you supposedly have a good eye for balance and, and composition and, uh, and, and colors. And, uh, and even as an architect, you need to have that, that, that skill. And so, so those, those, uh, those traits uh, transfer over into into engineering, uh, because you know you can you can engineer a, a solution to something, but if it's not elegant, you know, not a simple you know simple design, and then it's going to probably you know it'll work, but it'll be you know it won't it won't inspire, it won't uh, uh, and it'll probably have uh, the need to come back and redesign it. But uh, there's something called uh, something I call complex simplicity, which sounds like an oxymoron. But the simpler you can do it, the more complex it is to get to that to that simplicity. It takes a, it takes a, it takes a lot to be to be to make an engineering simple uh, and elegant an engineering project. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, so as we wrap up our career chat here with you, Sam, we have a few more questions, but this is a little bit different. We call it rapid fire. So I'm going to ask you a question, and whatever comes to your head, I'm going to give you 30 seconds to answer. Oh, okay. Are you ready? Ready. Go for it. <laughs> okay. How is it being, or is being a founder and CEO hard? Solar circuits in Florida. Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> it takes a lot of time. <laughs> it takes a lot of your time. If you want to be a founder of a new company and CEO, you better be prepared to spend more than 40 hours a week. The traditional, the traditional 40 hour week, you figure more like 80 hours a week and it's it's 24 seven. So, well, but I guess the pro is you're your own boss. So it's probably like that's risk reward. Side. Yes, that's the good side of your own boss and you can do the way things that, uh, that do things the way you want. Yeah. Have or will you design something for Mars, Jumble Jupiters in Indiana? Yes, we have already. We we have a, a design for a habitat on Mars, uh, and that's a three D printed habitat. It was one of our first habitat designs. We entered a competition in NASA, and uh, we came in fourth place. Oh, cool! But, uh, uh, unfortunately, the money was in the first three places, so we didn't, we didn't uh -huh. get it out of it. <laughs> So I like to say we have we have projects. Xarc has projects on all three planets. We have we we are interplanetary architects. We have planned the projects on the moon, Mars, and Earth. There we go. I love it. Okay, Dragon Slayers in California ask: Did you ever experience failure when you tried to make something? Can't talk about that. Uh, yeah, um, uh, the one I just you know the failure of a company. Uh, all, not all my companies have been um, uh, uh, successful. And as I mentioned earlier, you, know, you need to go through failure to learn. Hmm. Yeah. What was your fir very first creation you did for space? And this is a question from Florida. Yeah, that was the, uh, the lunar base design that we, uh, uh, that we looked at at the very beginning of this presentation. Uh, that, that base it was designed in 1987. That's when, when my first project. That was actually my student graduate project. Oh, yeah. that's cool. Yeah. Out of all the countries you visited, which is your favorite? The Little Einsteins in Wisconsin. Oh, that's a hard one. I've been around the world a couple of times, and they're, they're all they're all <laughs> cool countries. Um, so I've lived in Spain. I've lived in Germany. I've lived in the Philippines. Wow. I've gone to, gone to Japan, uh, China. Uh, uh, Korea, uh, all countries are, have their own unique uh, character to them. So it's, it's it's hard to tell which is my favorite. You know, I guess the United States. The politically correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining us and kind of sharing your story and these really cool projects. Um, but if you have a couple more minutes, I want to share what our Space Club students have been working on uh, here this semester. Sure, sure, be glad to. So our teams are either on a mission to moon or a mission to Mars. Uh, so a few submitted for mission to moon this week. We have uh, the spacesuits you can see with like the helmet. Those are from Bloom Carroll in Ohio. So a little bit of design there. That's and, cool. Yeah. And the roller coasters you can see from Wilkins in Illinois. All right. 
And our second highlights is for Mission to Mars, which I'm actually going to play an epic video for you. So just sit back and enjoy the show. All right. <laughs> What'd you think? Those were cool. <laughs> I, really, I really enjoyed that. So they were working on the space lander mission, if you couldn't tell, and they were trying to keep their two astronauts alive, the uh -huh. ping pong balls, as they were dropping it. And a couple of the teams went so high to the second story of their school and had some pretty epic landers. <laughs> I really enjoyed that. That was pretty cool to watch those guys. <laughs> All right, so now what we're going to do is our raffle. So all those teams that we just featured uh, submitted their designs, and we are going to give one team this really cool solar-powered robot. Oh, wow. <laughs> all right, so what we do is we have this picker wheel, which has all of our teams. Uh, there's 75, I think, submissions on this wheel, and we're going to spin it and see who wins. Let's do it. All right. <laughs> Good luck. Ooh, Among Us from Face Middle School, congratulations on winning the solar robot. All right, so that brings us to the end of our this week's career chat broadcast. So thank you again, Sam, for joining us. Any final thoughts or words for all the students watching? Uh, yeah, um, first of all, thank you for having me here. I, I really enjoyed it, and, uh, and it really, especially seeing that video, it really, really inspired me to think that, you know, you can, you can have an idea and you can, you can go with it, you know. Uh, it's fantastic. So, yeah, so, you know, my partner works with me to just follow your passion, you know, and, and, and keep up with it. If you think you want to go in some direction and it's, it, it makes you happy, go for it. And don't give up. I love it. Well, good luck to all the teams that are working on that lander challenge, our teams that are in the competition, coming up with your habitat designs, and we will see you guys next week. Bye-bye.